I'm Mike Frumkin. I'm the Dean of the College of Health and Public Affairs. Let me welcome you to this is our third year of doing our Distinguished Urban and Regional Planning Lecture Series. Um, and you're in for an amazing experience tonight, as I think many of you already know. Um, Dr. Jackson's work has had such a significant impact on so many people across this country and across the world that um, it's just astounding. And so um, looking forward to spending time with him tonight, it's really going to be a treat. His work clearly fits the mission of the College of Health and Public Affairs, which is strengthening communities and changing lives, and that's why we're so thrilled he's here as well. I'd like to recognize our sponsors for um, tonight's event. And our series sponsor, and has been from the very beginning of this series, um, is VHB Miller Sellen, and we are so appreciative of their efforts and their willingness to sponsor these lectures for the community. They actually are also the lecture sponsor for tonight as well, so we really thank them. Um, our program sponsors are Canaan Associates, Tyndale Oliver and Associates, Usler and Wood, and the Winter Park Health Foundation. And our in-kind sponsors are the American Planning Association, Orlando Metro Health, Orange TV, and I was told to really stress Orange TV. Remember that if you get on this TV show, you will be on TV forever as this lecture recycles and recycles and recycles, and so you can learn everything just by watching. So that will be very good. We really do appreciate, by the way, Orange TV. Um, they've been with us since the beginning and they have created a repository of these lectures and you can go back and watch them as well and Florida Hospital. So would you join me in a round of applause for all of our sponsors. Okay, And it's now my pleasure to um, introduce um, the director of our School of Public Administration, um, Dr. Mary Ann Feldheim. Thank you, Dean Frumkin. Welcome, everyone. It is our pleasure to be back here again for our uh, third year of doing the Distinguished Lecture Series. When the advisory board was originally conceiving of this lecture series, they really wanted it for the students. They saw this as a way to bring in the top people in urban and regional planning, the people who had the new and exciting ideas that we may not get in the classroom every day. So we are so proud and pleased that that has happened and uh, want to thank again the sponsors and the people who have brought that together. In our urban and regional planning program, we have three concentrations. We have transportation planning, environmental planning, and planning healthy communities. What we, when we started, was just starting to take off. And if uh, you've been reading recently, health impact assessments are now becoming very popular and well known. We also are seeing that other schools in planning are bringing in the whole idea of planning healthy communities. And I teach the planning healthy communities class using Dr. Jackson's book. So it, uh, it is a thrill for me personally to have him here. I would like to introduce Jim Sellen, who is uh, our moderator and our uh, sponsor tonight, and he will be moving forward. Thank you, Mary Ann. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. This is a very important lecture. This is a very important topic. I think as our planning profession, morphs from uh, growth management to uh, sustainability that is now morphing into healthy community. But I think the difference may be that this is no fad. This is, uh, this is a topic that will stick, and it will stick because of the vocabulary. And when you hear Dick Jackson talk tonight, you'll understand what I mean by that. Because this isn't all acronyms. This is about real world effects on people and for the first time in my profession or my professional life I feel like I'm not planning for infrastructure this isn't about you know how many 
uh, vehicles we can get on a road or how much water we can get down a pipe. This is finally about people. And I think you're going to see that tonight also. Um, one of the things that uh, I think we've had difficulty with is understanding that there's a connection between the fact that we live in urban sprawl or we have urban sprawl we, that we live with daily and it makes no room for sidewalks or bike paths and the fact that we're overweight and don't look at me when I say that but uh, I'm sure I am and uh, we have heart we're a heart disease ridden society but um, what the research has started to show is that it's clear that the physical design of the places that we live in co clearly affects our human behavior at all scales all scales and that communities are designed in a way that supports physical activity <coughs> wide sidewalks, safe bike lanes, access to transit, access to recreation, mixed uses, uh, and encouraging residents to make uh, healthy choices and live healthy lives is important. And on the contrary, communities that are poorly designed result in populations that have higher rates of obesity and other health problems like asthma, diabetes, and depression, which we'll hear about tonight. And we just have never, you know, made that connection. In fact, um, just reading in, in ULI, uh, the, there was a statement that I thought was really uh, poignant, if I can find it here, and that was that uh, the discovery that today there is a significant knowledge gap that exists between research and implementation with health and land use practitioners uncertain of how to prepare plans that properly correlate the relationship between our built environment and our health. So there's this gap, and we're trying to close that gap. And if we can do that, we'll realize what's been more important to us than anything, and that is not making a buck, but making a difference in our society and in the places that we live. So with Dr. Jackson tonight, and I want to introduce him appropriately, um, we're going to have the first opportunity to hear you know, how some of that is being done across the country and some of the important aspects of it. Um, I met Dr. Jackson uh, for the first time through U Urban Land Institute at a meeting that we had, I guess it was in Sarasota, and uh, people were sort of in the room and they were listening and more people came in the room and it became pretty obvious that there was a lot of interest in this topic. Um, from that, we had the opportunity to be selected by Orange County, or excuse me, the city of Orlando, sorry Paul Lewis. Um, to do uh, the Paramore uh, Comprehensive Neighborhood Plan, and we convinced uh, Dr. Jackson to be on our team to do that. So for the first time, we're getting that firsthand knowledge of how to apply what Dr. Jackson's learned to a community here in, in Orlando, and uh, we think that's going to be really important and make a huge difference in uh, you know, being able to have an effective plan for that community. So who is Dr. Jackson? Well, he's professor and chair of environmental health science at the Fielding Pub, uh, School of Public Health at uh, UCLA, which is a long way, Dr. Jackson, to come to be in, here in Orlando, and we appreciate it. And he probably has a little jet, jet lag that we need to sort of uh, uh, give him a little uh, help or cut him a little chase for. But um, as a pediatrician, he served in many leadership positions in both environmental health and infectious disease with the California Health Department. And over the past decade, uh, much of his work has focused on how the built environment affects health. He's the host of a 2012 public television series, uh, Designing Healthy Communities, and co-authored two uh, Island Press books, Urban Sprawl and Public Health and Making Healthy Places. Um, so with that, I give you uh, Dr. Richard Jackson. So I should have asked this beforehand. Do, can I walk around or do I have to stay behind the lectern? Because there's nothing worse than somebody behind the lectern at uh, 8 o'clock at night or 7 o'clock at night when everybody's tired. So if you order me to the back, I will do it. But otherwise, I'm going to come up here and be with you because I'd rather be with you. How many of you consider yourselves health people. You either come from medicine or public health or the health side. Okay, it looks like about a quarter of the room. How many of you are come out of the planning world? Wow. 
How many of you come out of real estate, which I see is a little bit different from planning? So we got a couple of folks from the real estate world. Um, how many students? Okay, great. This is going to be fun. So uh, I want to thank Dean Frumpkin because the first author of my first book was Howard Frumpkin, not his relative that we know of yet. And uh, I want to help thank Mary Ann for her kind um, greeting. This is the textbook I use at UCLA, Making Healthy Places, and we'll move forward on it. I've gone through a legacy life transition uh, in the last couple of years, and I became a grandfather. <coughs> and being a grandparent, it's amazing. It kind of reframes what's important in life. You think a lot more about what am I giving uh, the future. And I put this picture of my grandson and the monarch butterfly here, and I'm going to come back to them as I go through. A week ago, I had to give a talk to the donors to the UCLA School of Public Health. And I was told by my dean, I have five minutes to describe all of environmental health and what's important in environmental health. So, well, in epidemiology, it's sort of like an oak tree. You've got this main stump or trunk that's, you know, ratios and proportions, and you put stuff all off that. Environmental health is like an aspen forest in the sense that you've got this big root structure and all these things are coming up. So over here is radiation and toxicology and endocrine disruptors and global climate change and all these other issues. And how was I going to summarize all of environmental health in five minutes? I had trouble sleeping. I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning trying to figure out, well, maybe I'll do radiation, maybe I'll do plutonium. You know, and I finally woke up one day and said, I'm going to do my grandson. Because environmental health really is about the world we're giving our children and our grandchildren. So that's what I want to be thinking about today. One of the fun things about being a grandparent is to describe to a child about this beautiful butterfly. And every child's very respectful of butterflies. They really, they're so beautiful and delicate. You say, wow, you know, that used to be a caterpillar. See this bug here? He's going to become a, a butterfly. And he, has to, he eats something that's really toxic, milkweed. And by the way, all physicians swear the Hippocratic Oath to Aesculapius, which is the old Greek god. Aesculapius is the name of this plant in Latin because it's toxic. And a lot of the original medicines were toxic. And any swallow that goes by and tries to eat this caterpillar or the butterfly gets really sick. And so, um, because they're toxic from the milkweed juice. What's he talking about? I'll come back to this and I'll explain it in a minute. But it's really fun to also tell the story about how the butterfly goes through, or goes through a transition. Uh, I'm the oldest of seven children, and when uh, one of the kids would be difficult, um, my mother would say, don't worry about it, he's just going through a phase. And I, I didn't realize how sophisticated that insight was until I became a pediatrician and realized that kids are really difficult, terrible too. They're going through the transition of being an infant um, toddler to really being sort of a preschooler. And a 14-year-old boy that's really obnoxious is going through this transition between being prepubertal and uh, sort of looking around in the world. And if you're my age, you're going through another transition, and my wife wonders why I'm grumpy, but um, it's just because I fly around a lot. Uh, the, but this idea of transitions and what's What's the future is one that we tell our children all the time. And the other part of the modern butterfly story is how this delicate, fragile creature goes all the way from Labrador to the mountains below Mexico City uh, to overwinter. And, and what a spectacular natural event this was. And there are large forests, they're not large forests, small forests filled with monarch butterflies. And you've seen these pictures, but I'll come back to it at the end because there's a relevance to all of this. So if the future's about our children, why did General Motors select to put this ad in all the major newspapers, college newspapers in the country, about two years ago? And G GM clearly had done some focus group testing. And in the focus group testing, they had really smart people on the other side of the one-way mirror, and they're asking college kids, what's your life like? Well, I'm really, I don't have much money. I'm worried about getting a job. My parents are impatient with me. My girlfriend doesn't like me anymore. And so GM realized, oh, the message that will resonate with college kids is reality sucks. And so they, they turned this into an advertised campaign. It doesn't have to suck. 
you can go out and buy a $28,000 GMC Sierra, spend the next seven years paying it off, and you will be happy, and no longer will pretty girls smirk at you when you're not adding to pollution, you're getting physical uh, exercise, and you're uh, not adding to congestion. So I was really annoyed by this, and I said, why, why would they demean somebody and say to them, stop peddling and start driving? And I was just talking to the students, I said, I'm really annoyed. One of the young women says, Dr. J, you don't know anything. She's not smirking at him. She's flirting with him because she doesn't want to be with the flabby guy driving the car. <laughs> so in pediatrics, we really track the progress of a child's development. And we do the, you know, the first thing that happens going into the pediatrics off, pediatric office is, What's the height and weight? And we almost don't care if you're 5th percentile or 95th percentile, but we really care if you fall off the growth curve and do something. Uh, you stop growing either in height or weight or you gr start growing super too much. Um, and so going into the doctor's office, the first thing they do is the height and weight, and then they do the blood pressure. And we're seeing about five kids like this every single day. The weight is too high, 95th percentile for weight. The blood pressure is too high because if you're way overweight for your height, your blood pressure goes up. <coughs> If you have metabolic syndrome, which is what we get with this, your uh, triglycerides and your uh, cholesterol levels go up. And, you know, maybe if you're 12 years old and in this kind of shape, you might be depressed at the same time. So, so what's a good doctor to do? Well, you could, you know, put them on a massive diet right there, and, but we don't. We send them to the overweight uh, clinic and we say, no soft drinks in the house, just none. No TV or screen in the bedroom if you can get away with it. Blue light at night keeps you awake. If you're awake too late, it's actually a risk factor for obesity. It's not good for you. Much more physical activity. Maybe you could walk to school, build, it, build into the day, get rid of the junk food and sodas from the house. And two months after that, the child comes back and really nothing has changed. He's lost one pound. He can't change the food at school. The kids don't want to play with him on the ball field because he's just not very good. And two months after that, what's going on? Nothing. Or at least he's taking over $300 worth of medications, something for cholesterol, something for sugar, maybe something for depression. So I say to my pediatric colleagues, have you seen a child like this today? Yeah, we've seen about five of them. And I say to my intern, my son's an internist, I say to my internist colleagues, you see people like this? Yeah, I'm seeing people like this all the time. I'm sitting at the end of the disease pipeline seeing people with diabetes and obesity and feel helpless in turning it around because of stuff that's gone on for the last 5 to 15 to 20 years of their lives. And what's gone on, in fact, is we've sought a medical answer for what is, in essence, environmentally induced disease. And so, the environment that we have built in America in many ways is rigged against our health, it's rigged against our kids, it's rigged against the doctor, and it's rigged against the rest of us. When I was a med student, we ran an event on the leading causes of death in the United States. I'm sorry, on the leading, uh, the costs of medical care in the United States. And 7% of all the money in the United States was going to medical care. And we thought that was staggering, thinking about building roads and ships and everything else. 7% of all the money? We're now at 19% of all the money in the United States. And my friend Ray Pentecost said the Soviet Union collapsed because they were putting 20% of their GDP, their wealth, into something that wasn't productive. In this case, in their case, it was a military complex. Here, you know, all, the, all that medical stuff is productive to a point, but sooner or later you can't put huge amounts of an economic base of a country is just into services. Well, we now spend twice as much per capita on every single person in America as any other country for medical care, and we don't live as long. We're number 46, so we spend all this money and we're not getting much out the other end. So folks say, well, I don't like Obamacare. Well, nobody likes the present situation. We're paying a lot of money and we're not getting much for it in a society. And I'm not criticizing the fine doctors that are working hard in this hospital, but I am saying the system that we've got isn't taking care of people and doing enough prevention. So, in the 19th century, they were confronted with a tsunami of diseases. They were mainly infectious diseases. 
Average lifespan was about 46 years. And people died of leading causes of death were tuberculosis and intestinal infections and childhood infections, infectious things. And during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln asked this man to take over the military hospitals. His name was Frederick Law Olmsted. And Frederick Law Olmsted, working with Clara Barton, who started the American Red Cross, doubled the survival of injured soldiers. <coughs> they didn't know about bacteria. They didn't know about viruses. All they knew was if you put hurt and sick people in places that were clean, you changed the dressings, you gave them decent food, you gave them clean water and fresh air and sanitation, people got better. After the Civil War, he went back and he began to design the places in the United States, in many ways for me, that I love the best. Central Park is what you see there, Prospect Park, parks in all around the country, beautiful, beautiful parks in uh, Atlanta as well. And um, so of you have been up to Asheville, to the Vanderbilt, he devised all the green space there. Um, he was the father of landscape architecture. He did not understand the germ theory. He understood that people needed health. And he described a park as the lungs of the city. And you can't do without your lungs. It was what gave people respite and health and their well-being. So we've added 30 years to our lifespan in the United States. If you ask the average person on the street, why are people living 30 years longer than 100 years ago? They would say, oh, it was antibiotics and uh, good medical care and heart transplants and cancer chemotherapy. How many of it do you think came, those years came from acute medical care and how many came from the eyes? And by eyes, I mean infrastructure, built environment, clean water, the stuff you do. The other eye is immunization, which is an infrastructure, really, because it's something you do for the whole population. How, what do you guess? How many years came from strict medical care of 30? 30 years benefit. Five. So the other 25 years came from what you planners do, and what the engineers do, and what the architects do, and what the real estate developers do, and the people that bring prosperity, because prosperity is good for people too. Less crowding in a home is, tuberculosis went down long before they got the medications for it, because less crowding is better for people. So I spent 10 years at CDC. I went there the second time in 1994 to be the director of the National Center for Environmental Health. And in that job, I had a range of responsibilities ranging from cruise ships and destruction of the U.S. chemical weapons, the child-led program, down to thinking about climate change and health. And really a very complex job, about a lab with about 250 people and a budget at the beginning of about 60 million, at the end about a half a billion. Um, one day in 1999, the head of CDC calls in his directors, and he's writing an article on what's going to kill people in the 21st century. And I'm, the injury guy's thinking his stuff, and the cancer guy's thinking his stuff, and I'm thinking climate change, sea level rise, uh, endocrine disruptors, sperm counts, half of what they were 50 years ago, huge changes in our society. And uh, I'm driving down Buford Highway going to headquarters at CDC, and I look over to the right side of the road. It's a 94 degree day. It's 94% humidity. And I see a woman walking along and she's struggling and she's carrying a shopping bag, one in each hand, and she's bent over with osteoporosis and she's clearly having a hard time. She has red hair. She looks like my mother and I want to give her a ride. And I don't do it. I go to my meeting thinking big thoughts. And God, that poor woman. If she collapses, dies, the cause of death will be heat stroke and not absence of trees, not heat island effects, not poor air quality. And if she's killed by a truck going by, the cause of death will be motor vehicle trauma and it won't be absence of sidewalks, absence of nearby crosswalks, absence of public transportation, poor urban planning. Where I'm going with this is public health, what I do for a career, is about dealing with the causes of the causes of disease. So the cause of death, but then you look at the causes of the cause of death, that's really the stuff you gotta begin to intervene on if you're really gonna make any difference. Sitting at the end of the disease pipeline is not gonna make much difference. 
we came up with a Big Ten list. It doesn't matter where they are, but I began to realize that the origin of the Big Ten, whether it's climate or anything else, had its origin in how we built America. We built three million of these structures a year by 2005, six, and seven. What, what is the message? I asked my students in class, what's the message of that particular building? What's the most important thing in that family's life? Yeah, the, the family is an appendage to the garage. You know, <laughs> we've wrapped our li uh, house around the cars, and in America, we've wrapped our lives around our cars. So 25% of all the wealth in the United States in the 20th century came from cars in one form or another. We built this, the biggest public works system in the world ever done before the year 2000 was the US highway system. General Eisenhower observed the Autobahns in Germany, of course, during, at the end of the war. And he said, we need an interstate highway system like they have in Germany. And they it took us 10 years to build it. It was a national defense project, actually, to build a highway system. What they never intended was to run highways dead through the center of beautiful towns. And I had the pleasure of going through some of the neighborhoods today and looking at the beautiful oak trees and the uh, brick streets and, and the old houses. And um, never did they intend that we would run highways through neighborhoods like that. But, and that, thank goodness you preserved that. But. Um, we ended up destroying a lot of downtowns. We ended up taking out a lot of trees. So we've removed, we Americans, have removed 60,000 square miles of tree cover. That's the area of the state of Georgia. Just for surface parking lots, we've removed the area of the island of Puerto Rico. See, all that photosynthesis gone. All those trees that are gonna slow the water down and let the moisture go into the ground and let the water be purified so we can use it for groundwater, mm -hmm. removed. And one-sixth of all the CO2 increase, I know some people think climate change is a lot of baloney, but the CO2 increase is absolutely, absolutely real. And one-sixth of that increase is due to deforestation, just removing tree cover. We've also paved over, so how many orange trees are left in Orange County? <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, It's a big deal to pave over fine farmland. And you think that's a bad economic deal. In Orange County, California, they could grow citrus without any fertilizer, without any irrigation, and without any pesticides because they had 60 feet of topsoil that was there and it was high quality. You know, they could always get moisture down below there. As soon as you move plants, farm crops, to marginal land, you have to add lots of nitrogen, lots of um, amendments to keep things growing. So you really want to keep your best farmland and not simply plant houses on it. This is a picture of the Florida state flower. And um, <laughs> no, it's California state flower. Um, sidebar. So 1955, they're opening Disneyland in California. I'm a little kid in New Jersey. It's a hot day in August. And all the kids come over to the house and we're watching this little black and white TV. And, they got, oh, this Disneyland, they got like Tomorrowland and Futureland and even a place that looks like a normal neighborhood with uh, streets and all that. And um, they are looking at the magic mountain and the camera pans back and you can see Disneyland. And then you see over here, Highway 5. And Highway 5 freeway has five cars on it. And I'm sure the whole country, oh, the roads are free and it's got only five cars. Well, everybody in the country, except for the ones that moved to Florida, moved to California. So we went from 7 million people to 37 million people over the course of the last 40 years. And every meeting in Los Angeles, and maybe someday where you are, starts with the statement, sorry I was late, there was a wreck on such and such. Because when you're operating a system at 105% capacity, it doesn't take much to uh, knock it all down. So driving is not good for you. Driving raises your blood pressure, raises your cholesterol, raises your cortisol levels, raises your adrenaline levels, and raises your risk of having a heart attack slightly, but during the whole time you're driving and for about the two hours after you finish driving, it's generally not good for you. And driving in this stuff is probably even worse because the air quality is so bad. Um, I took this picture this afternoon right here on campus, and uh, I, I hope it's not one of you that rear-ended the other car, but... Um, 
you know, the leading cause of death ages um, 3 to 34 is car crashes. So how many, anybody here drive 87 miles today? Roughly, okay. Um, any of you bought a lottery ticket this week? Smart group. Your lottery ticket for death, your one in a million lottery ticket for death is 87 miles. So every time you drive 87 miles, you have a one in a million chance of dying in the US. And, and driving's gotten a lot safer over the last 40 years. It's about five times, seven times safer. But we drive five to seven times as much, so our absolute death rate's about the same. Twenty is plenty. Pretty wild comment. If you're hit by a car going 40 miles an hour, you have an 85% chance of dying. If you're hit by a car going 20 miles an hour, you have a 5% chance of dying. So a lot of cities have moved, and I want to commend UCF because I saw a 20 is plenty sign there, and I think go for it, and I think it's probably fast enough in most of the neighborhoods. I also discovered in Orlando that you put these big gullies for the water to go through, and if you speed over them, you're going to lose the bottom of your BMW. <laughs> Sitting in a car raises your blood pressure, your cholesterol, but it also means that you're not walking very much and you're not exercising very much. And uh, every year, CDC calls up and interviews 200,000 people. How you doing? How tall are you? How much do you weigh? What's your vision? Have you seen the doctor? What's your blood pressure? Da 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 da. And really, by the late 90s, we were shocked to discover that something weird was going on in the United States and people were getting heavier and heavier. So here's a map of the United States in 1991 with about 10 to 14 percent of the Florida population being obese. What do you think happened over the next eight years? Exactly. So here's 1997, 15 to 19 percent of Florida. The most recent map I could find is 2010, 25 to 30 percent of the people in Florida being obese. So we've got one in three of our children obese in the U.S. at this point, and two in three of our adults being obese. So these are big changes. The average adults gained 26, 27 pounds since about 1980. Average adult, these are immense changes in the population. And being obese is not good for us. It raises our blood pressure, our risk of a stroke, um, our risk of heart disease, of gallbladder disease, of bad joints, for a woman to have a baby with a birth defect, and one-third of our abdominal cancers are related to obesity in one form or another. So this is not good. But because I do environmental health, one day I sat down and calculated how much jet fuel we burned by the fact that everybody gained 10 pounds between 1990 and the year 2000. Um, and it turned out, uh, it comes to one and a half billion dollars worth of jet fuel, about four million tons of extra CO2, just to haul our additional adiposity around the United States. <laughs> and uh, it was the only report I ever did that was cited by Jay Leno. <laughs> that night, the CDC says we're burning more jet fuel because we're all getting fatter. Now I know why they don't feed us on airplanes anymore. <laughs> If you look at our demographics of who's gained the most weight, you, all, you know that it's, in many cases, our poor people, it's our minority population, we see more of it, and we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, but if you look at where the fast food joints are, there's many more of them in poor neighborhoods than there are in rich neighborhoods. And if you live in a poor neighborhood, it's a lot easier to get processed fast food than it is to get healthy, fresh food. And we'll talk about that more in the Q&A. So here's news that you can use. Um, if you take your son or your granddaughter to the fast food place, and they say, do you want to supersize that? And your granddaughter is really smart, and she says, Grandpa, um, we can get 17, 73% ca more calories for just 17% more money. It's a bargain. You can turn to her and say, no, dear, uh, every time you fast, uh, do a supersized meal, you add an ounce of fat to your body. Um, that's about $6 of additional health care costs for a man and about three and a half dollars for a woman, that one ounce of fat. This is kind of a cute story, but there's a metaphor here. It's too often in America, for short-term benefits, we trade off long-term risks, and we're much too willing to take these kind of useless long-term risks. This is kind of cute. My students did a, 
So I was health officer, and I went to Governor Schwarzenegger, and I said, uh, he said, what's your priorities? I said, you know, number one was terrorism preparedness, number three was infrastructure, and number two was the obesity epidemic. And here's this guy who was, you know, probably a puny guy in Bavaria who became Mr. Universe, and I could just see him thinking, well, obesity is a personal decision. And I, I went through this, no, no, our whole society is set up to make people obese. We live in an obesogenic society. I didn't use that word to him. And uh, so one of my students said, she drove down uh, Hollywood Boulevard there, and Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, and looked at the signs telling people what they should do. And basically, they're telling people to go to movies and buy Evian water, some kind of beer. What do you think it looked like in a poor neighborhood? Remember all the ads during the Super Bowl? They tell you to be healthy? In the poor neighborhood, they told you to drink stuff that makes you stupid, drink some more stuff that makes you fat, eat stuff that makes you fat, and then go get stomach stapling surgery when you do all the things we tell you to do. So we've created an environment that really is pushing people towards ill health rather than one that makes it easier to be healthy. Only technical slide in the group, and I'll move past it quickly. The more weight we get, the more likely we are to become obese. Who's more likely to be obese, the men or the women, if they get fatter, uh, over, more and more overweight? It's the women. Look at the, look at the risk, a hundred times almost for a woman if she's deeply, morbidly obese. And these are big, big risks. Everybody my age in this room has lost friends to <coughs> diabetes. So you know what's going to happen to the diabetes map in the United States. Here's 1994. Florida at about 5%, 2001, Florida about 7%, and 2007, Florida about 8%. You walk down the street now, probably one person in 10 has a disease that's going to cost them their eyes, their kidneys, and their feet. This is, we're now spending 2% of the entire GDP of the United States just on diabetes. It's almost a doubling. In fact, when I was a young pediatrician, I never saw a child with type 2 diabetes. Now it's half the kids in the diabetes clinic. And they're very, I'm not making this up, they're very difficult to manage medically. Teenagers are tough to manage with chronic diseases anyway, but diabetes is a tough disease to manage also. <coughs> Biggest change since 1970, 63 pounds of high fructose corn sugar. Biggest, um, probably the, one of the biggest risk factors is just how much sugar we're consuming in our diet. And years ago, it was probably under a pound total. Sidebar. This is where the United States government, which counties we give $14 billion a year in price supports to. We give price supports for corn and soy and four other crops. We give no price supports to tomatoes, avocados, grapes, things that actually, fruit, things that are good for people. We give price supports for things that are bad for people. $14 billion a year. By the way, they use this to grow mainly corn and soy, and they now plant the corn right out to the hedgerows, and there's no set aside for environment, there's no set aside for creeks, and uh, they're making corn ethanol, among other things. But they use a lot of atrazine, this herbicide, and a lot of um, uh, glyphosate, or Roundup. What am I talking about? Why am I talking about this? Uh, slight, uh, size. Why I'm talking about it is this stuff kills milkweed, and we'll come back to it in a minute, and you know where I'm going with the story. If you walk 10,000 steps a day, you reduce your risk of diabetes if you're overweight by about 7%. No drug works as well if you have type 2 diabetes. Um, I'm gonna, these are the climate change slides. When I was born, the climate level was, CO2 level of planet Earth was 300 parts per million. Today, it's 400 parts per million in my lifetime. And th this is uh, basically predictive. This part of Florida was zone nine for somebody who was thinking of planting a tree in 1990. And I guess you're still zone nine, but Atlanta's gone from, um, let's see, Atlanta went from zone seven to zone eight just in that many years, and New York has moved one full zone. New York is now as hot as Atlanta just over the course of 20 years. So, these changes are really occurring. I know, this is why I had the next. So, 
Anybody here 29 years old? There has never been a cooler than average year in your lifetime. So curves just go like this. Every year in your lifetime has been above average according to the last 100 years worth of uh, temperature change. Turning Texas hot had a real implication. No rain, no drought, and a hot Texas. So we'll come back to that in a minute. All right, so we're going to need resilient people, resilient buildings, resilient infrastructure. You can't see this, but this is when I was the Secret Service guy guarding Governor Schwarzenegger. And um, what it was was about creating healthy food for communities and um, price supports for stuff. We need to convince people, young people here, that if you eat food spelled backwards, you're a doofus. <laughs> um, oh, I, don't, I must have put the wrong one in. Um, actually, we had a long talk this morning. We just got rid of minimum acreage standards in California for schools. The relevance of this is schools need to, especially uh, primary schools, need to be in kids' neighborhoods, and kids need to walk and bike to school. Kids who walk and bike to school behave better, socialize better, and um, are easier to manage than kids who sit in a car the whole way. Um, in fact, I'll just ask, how many of you, when you went to school, were happier in a small school or a big school? Small school? Big school? Exactly. And yet we build, we've taken the Walmart uh, philosophy and we've made bigger and bigger schools and then wonder why, and we do it because, you know, save money on uh, janitorial services and other things, but it's really about money. It's not actually what helps kids learn better. My kids went to a school, it looks like this one in, in Atlanta, and it, every time I walked in there it felt like a medium security institution be, you know, with the, the metal detector and everything else. Look what's happened to kids walking and biking in one generation. Folks my age here, on Saturday, when you got up in the morning, did you, uh, what was the one instruction you got from your parents when you went out on Saturday morning? Come back when the street lights go on, right? And, that's, and, and you just basically were feral. You ran around the whole <laughs> time. Uh, and now we've made our kids, partly because of the way we've designed communities, kids are completely car dependent. I'm going to skip this one. This is, we pediatricians, right, we tell people this is what the medicines you ought to use, this is how you're going to prevent injuries. This is the first time in the history of the American Academy of Pediatrics they wrote a prescription for what kind of neighborhoods children should grow up in. This is pretty wild. And what it's saying is children need to be in neighborhoods where, of course, there's, you want them safe when they're three and four. They need to be protected at that age. But when they get to be five or six, they need to investigate their world. Kids learn by immersing themselves in the environment and being active in the environment. You get to seven, eight, and nine, you've got to be out exploring and meeting other kids. You've got to learn how to deal with nice kids and bullies. You've got to learn how to deal with life a little bit. And by the time you're 10, 11, or 12, you ought to know how to get on a bus and, and get somewhere under your own or on a bike safely, uh, so you can meet some of your life needs. And that increase in autonomy is important in children's development. And when you don't give children safe risks, when you don't give children safe risks, what kind of risks do they take? Because they will take risks. They take stupid risks. And we don't want our kids taking stupid risks. We want them to do you know, things that are exploring and let their uh, autonomy grow. So we need physical activity. At our age, Jim, Yes. If we're At your age. very fit, yeah, <laughs> well, my age. Um, <laughs> we go from low to moderate physical activity. We add about six years to our life. It's as good as stopping smoking. So being exercising more is good for us. The most prevalent disorder in America, I'm not making this up, the most prevalent disorder, if you don't count d dental cavities, dental caries, is depression. And your grandparents knew how to deal with depression. You had family dinners, you had festivals and get-togethers around funerals, you, uh, other kinds of events. You had music, you had socialization, you had church, you had ways of being together, barn buildings or whatever it would be, building barns. Um, now we treat depression by giving people SSRIs, fourfold increase in the prime of life, fourfold increase ages 18 to about 40. 
the best treatment for mild to moderate depression, I'm not making this up, is physical activity, physical exercise. And if you do that physical exercise in green environments, it's even more effective. And so when you build neighborhoods where kids can be active, run, play, and there's trees and maybe water features and coots in the lake, it is a health intervention. It's really a benefit beyond just cosmetic. This is a study done, just came out, profile of all the, it's a snapshot, a robust snapshot of Americans' help over the, comparing people in the prime earning years 20 years ago with just the last couple of years. Overall health status, so 46 to 64, 20 years ago now, people say they're in excellent health, it's really a good sign. It means they're gonna live a long time because people say, I'm in excellent health, really do pretty well. What do you think of that? This is honest snapshot of the American self-described health. Can you go about your life or do you need help? Do you need a wheelchair? Do you need this or that? Do you need a wheelchair or a cane? Doubling in just 20 years of people needing that kind of help. And you see it when you go into a, a big superstore. What do you think happened to obesity and smoking? Obesity went up, smoking went down. For the last 40 years, we doctors have been wagging our finger at people and telling them, you gotta exercise, you gotta move, you gotta move around. What do you think happened to physical activity over the last 40 years? How successful do you think we've been? I, this is jaw dropping. I mean, we knew we weren't doing a good job, but this was like, oh my God. And where I'm going with this is, we cannot get anywhere wagging our fingers at people. Sooner or later, you've got to create environments that entice and make people want to be physically active because it's not gonna work uh, any other way. So the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences was asked, what should we do about the obesity epidemic? And they came out with 14 recommendations. Planners, architects, real estate people, 14 recommendations. Yeah, they talked about sugar and fat and everything else. Recommendation number one. Number one was communities, transportation officials, planners, health professionals, government should make promotion of physical activity by substantially increasing access to places and opportunities for these activities. That's for a bunch of docs writing a prescription for the planners and designers. <laughs> I love this study. People a bit older than me, they did MRIs on their heads. Then had they had half of them be physically active for the next year or so, and the other half just did whatever they wanted to do. They went back a year or so later and did MRIs in their heads again. And the non-active people, their brains got smaller by 1.5%. The active people, their brains got bigger by 1.5%, about 3% difference. And at my age, brain size really does matter because if it shrinks, it's not a good sign. So kids is a little tougher on this one. This is data, and there's a lot of data, probably every week, every other day there's a study coming out talking about design and health. This is a study of a smart growth community in California. They put accelerometers and uh, GPSs on kids. Uh, the kids in the smart growth, well-designed community were 46% um, higher level of physical activity. So we're not, we're back to not waving our fingers. The kids on their own were being more active in communities that were built for them to be active. And, 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 and we need beauty and nature because life sooner or later ought to be about fun and happiness. Um, this is a, oh, sorry. These are the uh, design guidelines for New York. Uh, every new building in New York ha is day lit and sustainable, but it also encourages and welcomes physical activity. Nobody wants to walk upstairs that are dark, dirty, smell bad, and they feel nervous on but you need to walk upstairs because one flight of stairs a day is a pound of body weight in a year. That's how many calories that much stair climbing is. Kaiser Permanente, the health company in California, has been pushing for people to be more physically active. I just don't know, John, how they got the, past the safety people with this picture. <laughs> You're probably doing some bike rental uh, like in, in DC. Uh, it's coming, yeah, it's great. Although, I, this is at Union Station in Washington, D.C. I took this picture the, a couple months ago, and here are two police vehicles. 
they were probably off having lunch or donuts or something, but um, <laughs> I, so I, I thought, I wonder what they cost, and I wonder how many calories you burn on the bike versus the Segway, and one costs seven times as much, and one burns three times as many calories as the other, and it's a metaphor for America. Why would you buy the thing that requires more maintenance, costs more, and you get less physical activity? And I really, I, these are ads for the two, the Segway and the police mountain bike. And I love the fact that the cops on the Segway are fatter than the cop on the mountain bike. <laughs> you, are you doing studies of the light rail system? Do you have a capture of the population before and after it went in? Because we, are you, it would be really interesting to go and see what happens to the portion of the population that takes the light rail versus those that don't. When they put the light rail into Charlotte, North Carolina. People just randomly, you know, they start taking light rail because they wanted to read a book and save money and not be stressed out. And about half the town started doing it and half the other town didn't bother doing it. They went back and looked at the health status of people taking light rail. And the person, persons taking the light rail after a year or so were weighing six pounds less. They didn't even know they were doing a health program. They thought they were just saving money. 56% of the people looking to buy a house not, now want to be in a walkable, bikeable neighborhood with access to this. I put this slide, and this is Indianapolis. Um, they put a bike route all through Indianapolis. Guess how they got through the door in the first part? They actually, it was an arts campaign, an art walk, and then it became an art bike route. And the donor, the philanthropist, came up with arts money to get it going in the first place. Um, and it was really kind of... Interesting, but now uh, it's generated a huge use of the downtown. This is a genuine recommendation. Los Angeles has wonderful weather, um, and people think of it as the most bicycle hostile place in the world. Three years ago, they closed down Wilshire Boulevard, which is a big, busy street. And they expect, well, maybe 30,000 people would come out to bike. 200,000 people came out to bicycle Wilshire Boulevard all the way from Westwood downtown. And people were, wow, I didn't know the buildings were so beautiful. I actually didn't know people were nice. Um, you know, <laughs> and they were just blown away. And I talked to a police officer. I said, how's it going? He goes, oh, I love this. It was amazing. And the consciousness about bicycling in Los Angeles has changed dramatically with Ciclavia. We're now running it about every three months, and it's really become uh, an enormous festival in town. The Beltway in Atlanta has been a huge step forward. I'm, I really want it to be finished. I asked Ryan Gravel, he came to my class one day, and I, he's the designer and originator of it. And I said, Ryan, what was the most important thing in getting the Beltline to be put in place and to keep it going politically? He said, the community loves it. The community engagement. He didn't say the architecture, the design, the planning, the asphalt. It was community involvement that really made it want to stick. And my son lives there, and they just love it. If somebody had said to me 10 years ago, you could bike around Manhattan, I'd say you were crazy. And these, this bike route around Manhattan is people on it all the time. It's one of the best ways to see New York. If somebody said to me 10 years ago that somebody's going to take a railroad line three stories up, go through the worst parts of town, and make it a, the 10th most favored tourist attraction in the whole world, Travel and Leisure magazine, I would have said, you're crazy. And the High Line is one of the most delightful walks you will ever take. Three stories up, you can see the Hudson over here, you can see the city over here, and natural features. And it's fun to walk along with a little child, my grandson here, um, because a lot of the vegetation is stuff they found growing out of the, the, we the weeds they were growing and cultivated them that were naturally uh, adapted up there, but it's a place that people want to be. Would you like to go for a walk on the Chinoge Freeway in Seoul, South Korea? Have a glass of wine sitting there? They ripped it out. And they created, underneath was a river, and they created a place that you don't need to wag your finger and tell people to walk. They want to walk. They want to be physically active both day and night in a place like this. And so you know the Clean Water Act actually calls for every river in America to be swimmable, fishable? Well, I don't know. Alligators and water moccasins kind of scare me. But um, every waterway in America ought to be bikeable, walkable. And you wouldn't have to tell people to be physically active when there are the waters around. People want to be that way. So I'm almost finished. 
Who, everybody here knows what LEED is. You know, U.S. Green Building Council, sustainability. Guess what the U.S. GBC just made on a par, no, no joke, on a par with sustainability is health. And they're now going to embrace health as all their measures of how you build. And you're not going to get a LEED score unless it's healthy. AIAs embrace health along with design just as well. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip these. I'm sorry. Um, I will come back in the Q&A period because I, th I can detect people are getting a little tired. This is health impact assessment. I don't have a lot of love for environmental impact assessments, but I think there are a lot of good reasons to have health impact assessments because you'd end up with smarter decisions. But we'll go to that too. I'm going to skip these. Ah, and this is the one I want. So 10 years ago when I wrote an article saying, I think how we're building makes people lonely and depressed and overweight and inactive. And we need to build communities that really work for people. The National Association of Home Builders accused me of being guilty of worse than junk science and had members of Congress urge the head of CDC to fire me. I'm not making this up. The past month, the Urban Land Institute has just embraced the bu biggest builders in the United States, 10 principles for building healthy places. This is now in their, they're putting this in their DNA. And Peter Runnell, the head, the fellow that built Centennial, is one of the people most involved with this. And I love recommendation. I like put people first and champions for health, but I love recommendation number five. And if you can't see it, make healthy choices easy. And so maybe if anything else you don't remember from this, if you build and you make being healthy the easy thing, because now, right now, the easy thing is to eat the fat overprocessed, fat containing and overprocessed food and to not be physically active and to make it the easier thing that people do, they will do it. So, <coughs> butterflies. So the sanctuary in Mexico has been chopped down largely. The trees are almost gone. They need to really protect them. They need to create a bunch of new places for the butterflies to go when they get down there. Iowa's gone from 90% of the fields having milkweed to virtually none of the fields having milkweed, and so the poor butterflies can't get across. Many of the states are growing corn at this point. And the monarch population is crashing. It is disappearing. And so I fear that this beautiful animal, will, my grandchild will not be able to sit down with his grandson or granddaughter and say, there were these beautiful animals, these butterflies, and you'd be so happy when you looked at them. But we were growing extra corn, and we were not taking care of the places where we were, and we've lost them. And I think we owe our kids, and this is really what this is about, we owe our children and our grandchildren a world that is as healthful and safe and diverse and beautiful as the one we are given, if not more so. And when we forget that, this is a, we have cheated them terribly. So with that, let me stop and thank you very much. Thank you.